Dr. Sabrina Siegel with the Neuroscience Education Institute, and twice a month, I sit down with a renowned mental health care expert to discuss breakthroughs and best practices for treating patients with mental illness. In this episode of the NEI podcast, we are interviewing psychiatrist Dr. David Goodman. He is the assistant professor in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Sciences at Johns Hopkins School of Medicine and the director and founder of the Adult Attention Deficit Disorder Center of Maryland, Baltimore. We are discussing a very, very important topic, addressing Asperger's autism, and ADHD. I'm very excited to interview him today because we are going to be sharing a little bit of a sneak peek about his upcoming presentation at our conference, NEI Max, later this year in November. Welcome, Dr. Goodman. Hi, thank you for having me. Dr. Goodman, what can you share with us about the prevalence of autism spectrum disorder, or ASD, And what about the heritability risk? So the prevalence of autism is interesting because it would depend on what decade you asked. Currently, the prevalence from the CDC in 2018 is one in 59 children, which gives you a prevalence rate of 1.7% in the United States. However, this has actually increased two and a half fold since 2000. Now, if you talk to the opponents, they'll tell you that this diagnosis is being overmade. And they'll say that from the 1940s to 2016, there's been a 15 fold increase in the diagnosis of ADHD. And yet we would say as academicians and clinicians, that that's a good thing that we are recognizing autism spectrum disorder in many more children, adolescents, and even adults. And so I wouldn't be dissuaded from the opponent's argument that this is a problem. This is actually a benefit that we now understand the constellation of symptoms. The other interesting thing is that the ratio of male to female is four to one. So autism spectrum disorder as ADHD as well, as a higher prevalence in males versus females. And then we go to heritability. So the heritability is about 80%. And this is very much in keeping with bipolar disorder, ADHD, and schizophrenia. And what we've learned then over the last two decades is that these psychiatric disorders are highly genetically influenced. And this is not a function of bad parenting or refrigerator moms, or you got spanked as a child. These are neurodevelopmental disorders that need to be addressed in psychiatry. Right. So then would you say that the prevalence of ASD has actually increased over the years, or is it more attributed to what you were saying in terms of just better diagnosis? Well, that's a good question, and it would, be, it would be hard to discern the answer to that. It's interesting because when the prevalence of autism was, was first taken, it was based on childhood diagnoses. In the last two surveys with the CDC, they didn't look at the children or the adolescents. They asked the parents whose children have been diagnosed with autism spectrum disorder. And so you get a prevalence based on a diagnosis from the parent's report, but you can't be sure of the accuracy of that diagnosis. And that's why experts in the field may question whether one in 59 is an underrepresentation or an overrepresentation. It certainly probably accounts for why we see an increase in the prevalence rate. Well, we don't really know what the true prevalence rate is by getting the assessment from parents instead of accurate diagnosis of each and every one of the children and adolescents. Ah, that's so interesting. What would you say the comorbidity of childhood ADHD and ASD is? The comorbidity is relatively high. So you'll remember in the DSM-4, if you had autism 
you couldn't be diagnosed with ADHD. And yet the pediatricians and clinicians taking care of these patients knew that that just wasn't the case. DSM-5 has now allowed for ADHD to be diagnosed with autism. And I think the treatment, which we will discuss, is really remarkably helpful for the autistic children, adolescents, and adults who also suffer from the cognitive impairments of ADHD. But if you look at a population of just ASD and you say, well, how many of these have ADHD? The comorbidity range is actually quite high. It's anywhere between 22 and 83%. So of those with ASD, pick a ballpark number of 60% will have ADHD. If you just look at the ADHD population and say, how many of these patients will have ASD? It's somewhere between 30 and 65%. So what is the point here? It's not an either or diagnosis. If you make the diagnosis of one disorder, go looking for the other disorders as well, because you may be able to find the other disorders that will be remarkably responsive to treatment, whereas the core symptoms of autism really don't have any clear benefit from pharmacologic uh, interventions. And we can talk about what those agents are because there are some FDA-approved medications for ASD. Right, right. Yeah, we'll, we'll get to that here in a little bit. How has the diagnosis of ASD changed over the years? Can you go into a little bit of the history on that for us? Well, the history is really quite interesting. Leo Kanner, who was the division chief of child psychiatry at Johns Hopkins Hospital, was the first to publish on this in 1943. And he wrote the definitive textbook on child psychiatry in English as well in his career. We're actually quite proud of him as being a member of the Johns Hopkins faculty. But he talked about autistic disturbances of affective content. And he talked about the inability to develop relationships, obsessive desire for sameness, uh, fascination with inanimate objects, aloofness, lack of imagination. Hans Osberger, who then picks up on this and is doing the work at the same time, notes that there are a group of these kids who actually have normal intelligence and still have these social difficulties. So he called it autistic psychopathology. He did not actually name the disorder Asperger's. That wasn't named until Laura Wing, who was a psychoanalyst, came along decades later. And instead of calling it autistic psychopathy, she called it Asperger's syndrome. And why was that? Because the term autism actually was used by Eugene Bloiler, who wrote about schizophrenia. And so autism in the early 1900s was associated with schizophrenia. And so in order to get away from the confusion of the term autism, Dr. Wing said, let's call it Asperger's syndrome, which is what we know as high-functioning autism. And that's really how it developed. Now, it's interesting because the, the analysts come along in the 1950s, 40s and 50s, and the unfortunate aspect of their contribution, in my opinion, is that the term refrigerator mom came on the landscape or the schizophrenogenic mom came on the landscape. And this was the association of parenting to the outcome of these disorders. And this was actually a widely held belief in the 1950s and 1960s. Fortunately, we have moved away from that and have come to understand that autism is a neurodevelopmental disorder largely influenced by genetic factors with some environmental factors that contribute to the, to the risk of development. Wow. Now, since you explained a little bit about what Asperger's syndrome is, can you go into that a little bit more and give us maybe some examples of Asperger's syndrome? So the Asperger syndrome term now has pretty much collapsed into autism spectrum disorder. And when that happened, the people in the autism world were upset because the 
Asperger's syndrome patients were those who had the core symptoms of autism, but they were not intellectually impaired. And so you had normal IQ ranges, but you still had the core symptoms of autism with the social awkwardness, difficulty establishing relationships, fascination with inanimate objects and alike. And you have the autism spectrum, which is a spectrum of nonverbal autism to verbal autism with, with IQs that are lower, and then you move across the spectrum. So the IQ level can change in the spectrum, but the core symptoms of autism really don't. And that's the social impairment. And that's how we make these distinctions. And so as a result, you'll often see people who have normal IQ or even high IQ that have these autistic symptoms and impairments in their social relationship and their social function. And they tend to be awkward people that have difficulty in social situations. You know, it's interesting now in the world of uh, COVID-19 and stay-at-home orders, the people who have autism or introverted personality mm -hmm. features actually mm -hmm. say, you know, thank goodness I can stay at home and not in the <laughs> world. Uh, so there are some yeah. people who are actually quite comfortable with, with the work at home, stay at home, and not interact much with many people. Right, right. So my next question is, what are some symptoms that seem to overlap between ADHD and Asperger's syndrome? So there are several areas that overlap. Attention, social interactions, special interests, sensory perception, and motor activity. So let's talk about each. In regards to attention, the ADHD individual has inattention in part because of distractibility, either external factors that distract them or internal factors like mind wandering. The Asperger, the ASD person, has inattention in regards to the difficulty in flexibly shifting attention from one task to another. So in the world of ADHD, you might describe that as hyperfocus the inability to task shift. But in autism, these people get stuck on a task and they become repetitive in staying on the task. So that's the attentional component. The overlap in social difficulties is, as we know, the ASD person has difficulty with social interaction, reading social cues, understanding the subtleties of verbal language. The ADHD person in regards to social interactions gets in trouble because of their impulsivity, their intrusiveness, interrupting verbal impulsivity. The special interests, the ASD individual develops special interests. So I have patients who collect action figures. They're 45 years old, they're still collecting action figures. That's wow. a special interest. The ADHD okay. into person has a special interest where they'll hyper-focus on something but it's not the peculiar uh, level of interest. It's not focusing on their action figures. They're focusing on a task and they want to make sure they stay and then they get terribly involved and can't shift off. So that's a okay. difference. If you go to sensory perception, the ASD person has difficulty with textures, noises, fabrics, food, perception of pain, Whereas the ADHD individual is sensitive to noise, they may have hyperacusis and they're easily distracted by noises or they can pick up noises that are at, at relatively low volume. But you can see the differences in, the, in that overlap. And finally, we come to motor activity. So the ASD person has motor incoordination. They really don't have a sense of where their arms, their legs are and being able to coordinate in a very subtle kind of fashion. So for example, they're less likely to be involved in sports activity. But the ADHD individual in regards to the motor activity, they're usually hyperactive. And as a result, they, they lose a sense of where they are in space relative to other things. So they're clumsy, they're often knocking things over or they're dropping mm. things. And so right. even though I've carved out those phenomenologic differences and these overlaps, 
if you inquire and you understand how to inquire about that, you can actually separate out what is autism and what's ADHD. And you need to be able to do this with a patient who has both. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Wow. That was such great information. What is the comorbidity rate of other psychiatric disorders when a child is diagnosed with ASD? So what are some of those other, what are some of the other most common comorbidities that occur? When you make the diagnosis of autism, or in fact, any psychiatric disorder, you ought not stop with the most obvious psychiatric disorder. This is why comprehensive psychiatric evaluations are important so that you run through the myriad of possible other psychiatric disorders in order to check off what's there and what's not. For the ASD child or adolescence, the overall prevalence of comorbid psychiatric conditions is about 70%. So that's high. How does that break down? About 40% will have anxiety disorders and about 25 to 30% will have ADHD. About 25 to 30% will have oppositional defiant disorder. So those are the top comorbidities. Then you have OCD at about 17%. Now, you'll ask, well, what about mood disorders? It's really interesting because in the child and adolescence, the mood disorders prevalent rates are actually quite low. So depressive disorders can range between 1% or 20%. But when you look at the bipolar, it's about 1% to 1.5%. And why is that? Because although you have bipolar disorder in childhood, most of the bipolar cases start between the ages of 15 and 22. So you really have to wait until the child ages into young adulthood mm. in order to see the first index case of bipolar right. disorder, whether that's a depressive episode, which is usually the first onset, or whether it's a hypomanic episode or a hypomanic episode provoked by an antidepressant that you might have been using for an anxiety disorder. So it is important not only to cross-sectionally assess for a comorbidity in a patient who has ASD, but also as you follow them longitudinally over time with, with age to note yeah. whether there's going to be a new onset mm -hmm. of a primary psychiatric disorder that's now comorbid with the ASD. Wow. That sounds so important, you know, just to be able to track that throughout the lifespan. Once you understand the complexities and the comorbidities, you begin to understand why good diagnostic training is critical for diagnostic accuracy. And without right. diagnostic accuracy, any treatment that you institute may not be as effective as you had hoped it to be. Because if a person has several psychiatric conditions, the object is to come up with a diagnostic prioritization in order to treat one without making the others worse. And speaking about treatments, what are some of the treatment approaches for children with ADHD and ASD if you were to try to treat them for both? So there's extensive literature on treatment of ADHD and ASD, and most of the pharmacologic trials have been done with methylphenidate. Why is that? Because Pediatricians, child psychiatrists grow up on methylphenidate. You get trained on methylphenidate. And so this is the agent that m most often gets used in child psychiatry for ADHD. There really isn't a lot of work using deamphetamine or bupropion in these patients. Bupropion would be an off-label use of an antidepressant for ADHD or if you were using it for depression in somebody with autism. Most of the literature then is methylphenidate trials for ADHD and ASD in children and adolescents. And if you treat the ADHD with methylphenidate, the ADHD symptoms get better. The core symptoms of autism do not. So you'll increase their cognitive functioning, but you don't necessarily improve their social functioning. Interesting. And how would this differ, the type of treatment approaches you would use for children with ADHD and ASD, how would this differ from treating, say, an adult with ADHD and ASD? 
So the adult population is interesting because first, most people aren't trained on diagnosing autism in adults, at least certainly not the high functioning autism. Often the children and the teenagers with autism are treated by specialists who understand how to institute behavioral programs with parents, how to improve social skills and creating environments where the autistic child or adult practices those skills. So behavioral therapy and treatment for children and adolescents is really critical. Medication is not the the end all and be all in this situation. Now that might be a bit different when you get to adults because if you have somebody with ADHD and autism, treating the ADHD with medication can be critical to raising their level of functioning if they have to work for example, in a job environment, improving their cognitive abilities would allow them to be more proficient in a job situation. And then using behavioral treatment. The adult is interesting because you can say to them, you have an autistic disorder. This is why you feel uncomfortable and awkward. And although we as clinicians might be reserved on offering that diagnosis, I will tell you my experience with my patients, most of them, it's a sign of relief. They'll say, wow, you really understand what's, what's not right with me? I said, yes, and this is, this is what we call it. So let's understand that this is what you have. You didn't choose to have it. Let's talk about what impairment you have during the day and figure out what's going to be helpful. And, and then they kind of get it and they embrace it and they understand where their strengths and their limitations are. Obviously, therapy, I think, in my opinion, capitalizes on people's strengths and everybody has strengths. And that's what we, we focus on in order to help them develop in the world and in relationships with other people. That's great. So that takes me to my last question, which is what are some FDA-approved treatments for ASD? At this point, the only approved medications are risperidone and aripiprazole. They're approved by the FDA for the irritable mood that's associated with aggression, self-injury, temper tantrums, mood liability. But they will not treat the core symptoms of autism, which are the, the social relationship issues, reading social cues, uh, language nuance. So you can control the behavior with these medications, which is useful so that it's not disruptive in, in the home or in social situations, but it doesn't hit the core symptoms. Ultimately, you're coming back to the behavioral treatment that right. speaks to learning skills. The skills can be taught in individual therapy or it can be taught in group therapy. So in Baltimore, I have some clinicians who run autism spectrum disorder group therapy with six or eight, and they sit every week and have a discussion about the situations they ran into. Uh, They work together to come up with social skills solutions. The therapist also contributes and polishes those. And that, not only are they learning new skills, but they're practicing those skills that they're sitting in group therapy. So that that can be remarkably helpful. That's great. Well, that's Good to know. And thank you so much for sharing all of this great information with us. Uh, We are so excited to see more about autism and ADHD at NEI Max and to see your presentation on this. So thank you, Dr. Goodman, for joining us today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. This episode has been brought to you by the NEI Podcast. With nearly 100 episodes, you can find us on iTunes, iHeartRadio, Libsyn, and virtually any platform that you prefer to listen to podcasts. If you've enjoyed this episode, we ask that you kindly leave a review for us. Go to any of the platforms mentioned and leave a star rating or a comment. We'd love to hear from you. 